Good evening, folks. Thanks for joining us today. We are getting ready to start our study on Romans tonight. Pastor Harry and I have been talking for like an hour and a half or something like that about this passage of Scripture that we're looking at because because there's so much to talk about in it. So um, we are inviting you to join us for a special two-part series of, of this section of Scripture because we just didn't feel like uh, we could do it in one shot. And honestly, we could probably talk about it longer than that if we really wanted yeah. to. Okay. So we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 5 today, verses 10 through 21. Yeah, yes, that's 11 verses. <laughs> and uh, we're going to ask the question, why did the law come before Jesus? And uh, I, I know there's all kinds of thoughts about, well, there's the law of Moses in the Old Testament, right? And there are people who are concerned about, well, do I still need to follow all of the rules of the law? Um, and then there's other people who feel like they're totally absolved from following any law or rule. And, and there's all kinds of different ideas about why, you know. And I think it's important for us uh, to understand why God sent the law and what its purpose was. And why did the law come before Jesus? Yeah, I, I, I kind of look at the law as being like my second grade teacher. You know, it, she helped me to understand 2 plus 2 equals 4 and how to subtract things. And I'm far beyond that now when it comes to math and reading. And I really don't need my second grade teacher anymore. So you can do like 2 plus 15. I could, yeah. yeah. That'd be 17. Oh, See, man. <laughs> but, the thing is, is, but the thing is, is I appreciate my second grade teacher because she helped me to grow in understanding how I needed to operate in my life. And the and the law kind of does that for us. It, it it helps train us to understand what, what God desires. And so the scripture calls it a tutor. It does. And we might even read that scripture, but but let's read this portion of scripture because I think it'll help us just understand your question that you asked and that was is why did the, why did the law come before Jesus? I mean why didn't God send Jesus to be crucified, you know, back in Abraham's time, or to pay the price, you know, of a sacrifice in Abraham's time. That's a good question. And so we're going we're gonna to kind of uh, speculate a little bit about this, folks, and hopefully not too far away, but really keep it biblically sound on, on why the timing was such that Jesus was born and died during the Roman Empire and uh, the time of the Jews when that took place. Uh, God's timing is impeccable. It's perfect. And he knew exactly when Christ needed to be born. Matter of fact, it says at the right time, God sent his son. You know, So mm -hmm. there, was, there was a sense of perfection in the timing of God of when he sent Jesus. But so... Why, why did God have to take the people of Israel and, and really the world through all of these things, the history of the world before Jesus uh, showed up on the scene? And so we're going to read these scriptures to you. This is in Romans chapter 5, verses 10 through 21. All right. For, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed, when there is no law. Let me let me just stop there a minute, David. Now, I think that's a very important verse, verse 13. Until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed. In other words, it, 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 it wasn't uh, burdened. It wasn't processed. Um, it was, it was um, kind of non-existent. People didn't understand, oh, that's sin. You know, it was just there. It was wrong. They just didn't know it was wrong until the law came. It's kind of like what you talked about about the speed limit earlier. Yeah. If you're driving in an area with no speed limit sign, mm -hmm. there might be a speed limit, but you don't know what it is. The police officer comes along and pulls you over. You know, that might be the first time you figure out <laughs> that, that, that you were breaking the law because there was no sign. Sure. Um, the, the law, when it came along, helped people to know that they were sinning. That's right. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, you can go on here. Hey, there, there is a concept that just kind of popped into mind that goes along with that. What's that? Like, ignorance of the law is no excuse. You can still get a ticket for speeding just absolutely. It wasn't posted. And, and see, the thing is, is, is the people back then, if they didn't know that they were sinning, they died in their sins. They never, they never got to go to heaven. And so God in his mercy did what? He, he gave the law so that people knew there was a standard to live by. Yeah. And those that tried to keep the law, and the law did not perfect us. It was only as Christ came and died that we reached any sense of perfection through the grace of God. But, but the law helped those Old Testament saints to begin to live in a standard of godliness, preparing them for when Christ, when it says before he ascended, he descended and he led forth those that were captive that's a whole nother study that we could get into, but we oh, won't. Yeah. But but those were in a, those who had died in a sense of righteousness by honoring God, keeping His laws. Uh, there needed to be a sacrifice, and that sacrifice was Jesus Christ. And until He died, they were in a place of holding mm -hmm. in the bosom of Abraham or paradise. Jesus said, "Today you'll be with me in paradise," and so. There, there had to be a place that they were kept until they would automatically receive Jesus and say, absolutely, he paid out all the, the price for my sins. Now, there are those who died lawless um, because they had no desire to honor God. They no, they no longer desired to even operate in the things of God. They, they basically said, we're our own God, we're going to do what we want to do, and they, they invented their own gods, really. That, that's where God looks at the heart. That's you know, he knows what's in our heart. Is, yeah. is our desire to honor God, or is our desire to honor ourselves? Yeah. You know, and that, that comes out. The law helps us to recognize that, but God's still looking at the heart, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's... And if anything, the law helps us to understand the heart of God. Mm -hmm. what he really desires for us. Yeah. It's like you as a parent, you know, you talked about cleaning the room, you know. Your kids, they, they would live in their room without ever cleaning it up until dad comes in and says, this place is dirty, you need to clean it. And so suddenly there's the law. That's when you show up with a trash bag. It's like, <laughs> this floor isn't cleaned up, it's all going in the trash bag. And then all of a sudden they get real busy. <laughs> And, and it's for their own benefit. And that yeah. the law is given for our benefit. It's to protect us. It really is. It's it's like the guardrails on the side of a cliff, you know, mm -hmm. that keep us from going over and killing ourselves. Yeah. <clears throat> so we are in verse, verse 14. 14. Yep. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So uh, just a quick comment there. Moses is the one that God gave the law to, mm -hmm. to get to give to the Israelites. And so what he's saying there is is that death still reigned, yeah. even though people hadn't been given the law. Mm -hmm. uh, even And he, maybe even that they didn't even sin in the same exact way that Adam sinned. Mm -hmm. uh, their sin was different, but it was still sin. Yeah. So uh, verse 15 but the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. This is saying a lot. It is saying a lot. That's why we get two parts to this. Yeah. This is a really hefty, meaty <coughs> section of scripture. So then... As through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. 
Isn't it interesting how the one sin of one man affected many, mm -hmm. so the one act of righteousness of one man, Jesus Christ, also affects many. But the one man, Jesus Christ, was the perfect sacrifice. Yeah. Nobody else could play that role yeah. because they were with sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so verse uh, 20, verse 20, the law came in so that the, tra the yes, so that the transgression would increase. That's interesting. We're going to have to comment on that later. Mm -hmm. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, that last verse is deserving of a hallelujah. Amen. Be because, Amen. hey, there's sin that reigns in death and brings death to us. How exciting it is that there's a grace of God that reigns uh, through righteousness that was given to us mm -hmm. uh, by Jesus Christ. And that amen. leads to eternal life. Yeah, amen. I like verse 18 and 19. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through the one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life for all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. And folks, when we think about um, what Christ did on the cross as fulfillment for, for our sins and paying the price, if anything, it, it moves us to the place of going, Jesus, how can I serve you? What can I do? It, 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 it takes away the stigma of, Okay, what do I got to do to get God off my back? You know, kind of that, all right, what's my religious obligation? What do I got to do? Yeah. It removes that to the point of going, Jesus, what more can I do? What, what else can I do? What would you have me to do? How would you like me to live my life? And, and it's important for us to realize that God's desire was through the creation of man, he desired fellowship. He, he wanted to have relationship with us folks. He walked with Adam. He walked with Eve in the cool of the evening in the garden. He enjoyed that. Think about that. The creator of heaven and earth longed and looked forward to spending time with Adam and Eve in the garden. And he would walk with them. And I'm sure that Adam and Eve could ask God all kinds of questions. And God was right there in their presence they saw the glory of God, they saw the majesty of God, and they were able to talk with God and, and not be afraid because sin had not entered into the picture. And just the, the wonderful relationship they could have. However, we all know that when they sinned, they hid from God because sin brought fear. It brought retribution. It brought responsibility. It brought with them the, the whole heaviness of Oh, woe is me type thing. And God sent them out of the garden saying, no longer can you enjoy face-to-face uh, -face communion with me. You cannot do this. And he kicked them out of the garden, sent a, an angel with a sword to keep them from even thinking about going back into that garden. And since that time, God has longed for relationship with man that was like it was in the garden. And only as Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid for our sins, we now come to the place in our life where it's no longer the drudgery of keeping the law, but it's the honor and joy of serving God. It's, yeah. it's a whole different motivation in us where, where we're now able to walk with God. And, and like the, the old hymn, he walks with me and he talks with me. And, 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 you know, there's this joy that comes, or the song, I, I come to the garden alone, you know, and the joy we share as we tarry there. I mean, there's, there's a different motivation and relationship that we can have after we are brought by the law to this place of, oh, woe is me, I need help, to where we accept Jesus, and now we're free from the law of sin and death, and we now operate by the law of the Spirit. We, we're able to walk with God and enjoy him you know there's times when I driving in the car by myself going someplace and I'll just I'll just start singing in tongues or singing a song out to Jesus and yeah. I might be off key and not remember the words or something like that and kind of hum apart you know and say well God I forgot the words but yeah <laughs> yeah you, you know what this reminds me of 
I was thinking while you were talking, when, when I was a kid, th there would be times that my parents would give me a, a list of things to do. Like my dad would be like, you, you got to go, you know, clean up all the fallen sticks in the backyard or mm -hmm. something like that. And uh, you better do it before I come home, mm -hmm. you know. And if when he's coming home, I hadn't done that. Or maybe there was a list of things to do, and I'd done part of the list and not the whole list. You weren't waiting for him to drive into the driveway. No, not at all. There was this <laughs> uncomfortable anticipation of the arrival of my father. And in that process, I, I learned that it's good to do what you're supposed to do. But if I wasn't measuring up to what I knew I was supposed to do, there was an uncomfortable anticipation. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, maybe a fearful anticipation of, I I'm going to get in trouble, I'm going to get grounded. or mm -hmm. I think my parents figured out that maybe one of the most effective punishments for me was to put my nose against the wall. <laughs> I I'm pretty sure I hated that more than anything. <laughs> and I remember, like, like, I would just chalk up the minutes, and my parents, in their grace sometimes, would let me, okay, you got an hour with your nose against the wall, you know, <laughs> but they'd be like, you can do it in like 10 minutes at a time or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I remember that, 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 uh, I don't know, that was horrible. Just bad memories of my nose against the wall. Um, so you're saying you don't get real close to the wall to look at it anymore? No, no. I, I don't love the wall. Um, and, but, but isn't it interesting, you know, so there's. If you did things that your dad wanted you to do. There was almost an expectancy waiting. You couldn't wait for him to get home so you could show him, I did this. Yeah, there, there's there's a rejoicing that comes with that. Yeah. And it reminds me of 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 this. You know, imagine being a, a, a Jewish uh, follower of God in Old Testament times before Jesus came. And you weren't a Levite. You weren't the high priest. Mm -hmm. You were just somebody of one of the other Israelite. tribes. Uh -huh. Yeah, regular old Israelite. Mm -hmm. um, you had to go to a priest to make atonement for your sins. Um, I mean, that would happen like once a year, or sometimes they made a few trips into Jerusalem for some of the different feasts. I suspect there were times where they went to the priest and said, this is what I've done, what do I got to do? Right. And yeah. the priest said, well, you need to bring a pigeon, or two pigeons, or a goat, or, you know. Mm -hmm. and there was this, this prescription given to them, so to speak, a spiritual prescription. Yeah, and until they did that, like there was this guilt and condemnation that they, they probably lived under constantly. Yeah. That yeah. They're like, man, I hope the high priest is in Jerusalem making atonement for all the sins of Israel right now, yeah. because what if I die today? You, you know, like there was just mm -hmm. this this uncertainty that it, that they had if they were basing their righteousness on the law. Sure. And we know in the Old Testament that there were people who, who were right, righteous before God Mm -hmm. Apart from the law, but but if they were basing their righteousness on how they followed the law, that that would be kind of a scary feeling all the time. And 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 it was an annual event, you know, where there was a sacrifice for all the children of Israel. I mean, there were there were sacrifices throughout the year, but then there was the culmination of that one sacrifice for all of Israel that the high priest would go in and offer that. That, that, and, that was somewhat foreshadowing, wasn't it, of, it, of Jesus? It, it was. And, and can you imagine being an Israelite and, you know, you do all the preparation, the high priest goes in, he offers a sacrifice, it's received because he's not killed, you yeah. know, in the presence of God, and everybody rejoices, but on the way home from Jerusalem, you blow it. <laughs> you got to wait another 364 days you know, for that sacrifice. You're wondering, I hope I don't die during this time. Yeah, how horrible that would be. And yeah. That, that reminded me of, of in uh, John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman. So Jesus encounters this woman from Samaria. Yeah. And Samaritan Samaritans were like half Jewish in, in general. And, mm -hmm. and they, they followed like a form of the Jewish law a lot of the time, but maybe not the full Jewish law. And the Jewish people looked down upon them like they were second rate people, which is yeah. which is really sad. And and uh, Jesus encounters this woman and one of the things that just really stands out to me from his conversation with her is is uh, uh, she says to him and this is John chapter four verse nineteen and twenty, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Um, our, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And, and she was basically pointing out the fact that you Jewish people say that we don't measure up to the law, is, is really what, what she's getting at with that. You're saying we're wrong. 
Yep. <laughs> and so all of mankind, uh, uh, <clears throat> according to the, the, the following of the law, all of mankind didn't measure up to the standard of the law. Mm -hmm. All of mankind, even the Jewish people in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. they, they, they couldn't live up to sure. it. And Jesus answers her, and th this, is, this is really good news. He, he says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know. So he's saying that we know the law. Mm -hmm. So when we worship God, we worship God because we know the law, but you don't, you don't follow the whole law. He's identifying that, that there's that, that difference. You, you worship what you don't know, and we worship what we know, because salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, and it's now here because Jesus was here, mm -hmm. when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And Jesus was telling this Samaritan woman that that there was the law, but now that I'm here, you're going to be able to worship me in spirit yeah. and worship me in truth. And Jesus was changing some the, the the thinking of people very radically here. He he was helping to understand that God desires the right attitude, not the outward thing. Right. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talking about what we think rather than what we act, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, looking on a woman to lust after her is committing adultery, not, you don't have to do the thing, you know, even not touching a woman, just thinking about it is that action or, or wanting something that is like stealing already, you know, so Jesus was, was helping us to understand the heart of God is such that he wanted our thoughts and our imaginations to honor him, you know, yeah. to serve him. And and we couldn't do it outwardly. I mean, you know, when when we discipline our kids, you can tell the times that they're obeying you because they have to, but on the inside, they're not obeying you. <laughs> That's usually when the, the garbage bag comes out. <laughs> All right, I'll do it. But yeah. you can tell there hasn't been a change of heart. Right. And that's what God desires is that change of heart. You know, verse 10, going back up here in, in this portion, it says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And, and folks, before the law was given, People didn't know they were enemies of God. I mean, people just lived however they wanted to. And, and essentially, you know, before the flood, God said, every thought is evil, you know, that these people think, you know, every thought. I will, I, re, I, I, I relent that I have created man. I will destroy mankind. I will create, destroy creation. Uh, Noah and his family were the only ones that were found righteous in in. In all the world, you think about the tens of thousands, maybe millions of people that were there, and yet only Noah found favor? Wow! That says that mankind really fell away from God's purpose and desire of wanting them to fellowship with, that, that they would enjoy his presence. You know, we read in the Old Testament that Enoch walked with God and was no more. He was found righteous. He he was in right relationship with God, and God enjoyed his fellowship so much, he took him, you know. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize that we are created for his pleasure. He created us. And so, um, you know, what happens is, is man gets caught up in selfishness and what I want. I don't care what God wants. I don't care what this person wants. And, and so we begin to do our own selfish things. And then God said, something has to happen. So after the flood, mankind began to propagate again. And the eventuality is, is, that, is that God gave the law through Moses because man needed to have standards. Um, to me, the law was given so we wouldn't destroy ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, think about this. And I, I remember doing this with the kids uh, years ago. And I said, you know, rules are important for us. They're, they're kind of like the law. And uh, they went, well, I don't like rules. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's go outside and play volleyball, you know. What are the rules? Well, we don't have rules. We can have, we can do whatever we want. Okay. So we served the ball and uh, somebody said, that's out of bounds. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean that's out of bounds? There's no rules. 
Right. So you got to play that. You didn't play that. So we scored 100 points. Wait a minute. 100 points? What are you talking about? That's only worth one point. Well, there's no rules, so it's 100 points. You know, and, and and we did this just for a short time, and they realized that rules or laws are given so that we can enjoy life. You know, if if we don't have laws and rules, we we will not live the way that we should. It, it's like an owner's manual to a car. The owner's manual says, this is what you need to do to get the optimum performance out of this car. Well, if you throw the owner's manual away and said, I'm going to do whatever I want to do with this thing. You will not enjoy the benefits of that car and the optimum performance that it can give you because you don't you don't operate by the rules, you know, it's just whatever. And the, and the car can only last you for a half a year and you say, this is a junky car. Well, no, it's a junky driver because you didn't follow the rules. And in our lives, human beings are essentially lawless. We are with without control. Um Book of Judges says they did what was right in their own eyes. And if you read the Book of Judges, you'll find out there were some really strange things and goofy things that the people did at that time because they had no law. They didn't understand what the law was. You know, they just kind of lived however they wanted to live at that time until God gave the law and they began to operate under a sense of holy purpose that this is how we please God. This is... This is how we're to operate. This is how we're to treat one another. And so when Well, in the book of Judges, the law had been given, but they were not they following were, it. No, they were yeah. living what was right in their own eyes. Yeah. And and so they had largely forgotten the law. Basically yeah. they had. They had given away uh, any sense of purpose and propriety in in just serving one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, they basically forsook the law and lived however they wanted to yeah, live, you know. Did. Uh, it wasn't until the judges came, you know, throughout the book of, of Judges, that the people had a sense of holy responsibility. They got back to what the law had stated for them. Yeah, and different judges would direct them onto course. Even the kings did that. They directed them onto course, and sometimes they directed them off course. The good kings would always bring the people back to holy responsibility. Yeah. This is what God desires. And the people would repent. They would cry out and God would bless them and help them and heal the land. Mm-hmm. But then there were kings that said, we're just going to worship anything, whatever we want to worship. And and the people said, okay. And they went off track with it. So it's human nature is such as that we need guidelines. We need rules. We need control. Because without them, we just, we become lawless. We do what's right in our own eyes. We're seeing that today, folks. We see people that run into into department stores, grab merchandise, thousands of dollars of merchandise, and run out of the store, load it up in a car, run back in, take it, and go come out again. We see people being offended where they kill somebody because their order in McDonald's wasn't right. You know, I mean, uh, we we see the selfishness of mankind starting to to flare up again, and it's because there's no consequences. The law brought consequences. It helped us to see that this is wrong and it's deadly. And and so because of that, the fear of the law, the consequences, we began to operate in what we should do. It's like our kids. You know, if we let our kids get away with everything and we don't give them rules and laws, they'll grow up to be terrible people. You know, they will, they will you know, they'll whine, they'll complain. They'll steal from us. They'll lie to us because there's no consequences. So they'll have good character or poor character. Mm-hmm. You know, and good character comes through suffering a lot of the time. You know, we we, yeah. we learn through our suffering and our failures and the mistakes that we make and Absolutely. the struggles that we go through. Yeah. Many of the inventions that we have seen over the last couple of centuries came because of failures. <laughs> mm-hmm. And people saying we got to get this right. We don't like this. We don't like the way this went. So what can we do to make it better? And so they worked at it and worked at it and worked at it and finally came up with a solution. And we're blessed because they came up with solutions on many of the problems. Air conditioning? Air, man, I'll tell you today, right now, we're, we're, we're at 97 degrees, I think, when I came here. And I got in the car and it started to cool off. And on the way out the drive, I told Don. 
Thank you, Lord, for air-conditioned cars and air-conditioned homes. Hallelujah. Yeah. So, so we discover something as we're, as we're getting into this study, that the law was really important. It, you know, it was necessary. It, it was. You know, and sometimes we can look back and be like, well, we've been freed from the law because we believe in Jesus. But uh, that's, that's true, you know, but we wouldn't understand Jesus if we didn't have the law. And Not at all. Jesus came to fulfill the law. There, there's a scripture that talks about how Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. He, yeah. he fulfilled the law, um, and in fact, he established a greater law. We would not appreciate and understand the benefits of God's mercy without the law. Yeah, because the law shows us how much we need him and how much we can't do it on our own. Yeah. In Matthew 17, 20, <laughs> It, it says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, and those were the people in Israel that they were doing everything right. They observed all of the laws. Supposedly, mm. seemingly, but their heart was wrong, but, yeah. but they were following the rule of the law, like religiously. Um, so unless your righteousness exceeds them, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and that, that to me is like, such a proclamation that we can't do it on our own. We need Jesus. The only way we can be righteous is through what Jesus did. Yeah, I Nothing know. of ourselves. The only way you can be right with God is with the help of Jesus. So mm -hmm. next week, we're, we're going to do part two on this section of Scripture. And we, we're, we're going to end with that thought that this is our big conclusion today, folks. How much we need Jesus. Oh, thank you, Just Lord. Just look around the world and see... The, the, the need for Jesus to come in and, and the way of Jesus is to love people. The way of Jesus is is to honor God with our lives. And you know, if we honor God with our lives, we would do good to our neighbors. And and if we honor God with our lives, God 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 would help us to, to live with the benefits of his goodness and his character and all, all those things in our life. But, but when you discard the ways of God, uh, he, he allows us to make that choice. We can discard the ways of God and start, start to lose the benefits of knowing him. And we see that popping up in the world around us. And I, I feel like this day and age need, needs, needs a, a, a call of Christians to rise up and say, you know, we're going to be men of God. We're going to be women of God, you know, and, and not in observing the rule of the law of the Old Testament, but in following the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and letting the Spirit move through us to influence the world around us and, and to spread the, the kingdom of heaven. And You know, that's really what Jesus did. Jesus came and said there's a greater law, mm -hmm. and it's the law of love, because God is love. Mm -hmm. And God wants to move through us with loving the world. So we're, we're going to pray. And just as, as we're closing up part one, I, I want to encourage you today just to maybe acknowledge how great your need is for God and, and ask him to show you how to love the world the way he wants you to love the world. Because that really is what, what God wants us to do as, as Christians. So let's pray. Father, we come to you right now and we thank you for sending Jesus to Amen. show yes. us that there's a better way. And you sent Jesus to make a, a pathway to open the door into a better way so that we can live with the presence of God. The scripture tells us that, that Jesus and his sacrifice literally opened up the veil, opened up the curtain you know, that separated us from the presence of God. And uh, Lord, help us to know you. Help us to be able to... to um, not be ruled by our flesh, but live according to the Spirit. Mm -hmm. to, to not be influenced by the ways and the patterns of the world around us, but that we would be able to walk in the footsteps and the plans of God mm -hmm. that you have for our lives, Lord. Help us, Lord, to, to aspire to a greater law. And, and that, that law is the law of, of God's love. Mm -hmm. That we would love others the way that God wants us to love them. Yes. And that we would be able to personally stand in the love of God. I feel like there's somebody watching that uh, doesn't feel very lovable. And, and God wants you to know that he loves you. Mm -hmm. That Jesus came and, and sacrificed his life uh, so that you could be made right with God because he loves you so much. Yes. And I, I want to just invite you to ask 
the, the presence of God, the presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit to come and dwell with you mm -hmm. and ask him to begin to show you how much he loves you and, and how you can follow him and live, live as part of his family and part of his kingdom. And Lord, we just pray, God, that you would speak to people, that they would hear the voice of your spirit speaking to them and that they would know the presence of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. So come back next week for part two. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. This Sunday is Father's Day, so make sure you, you uh, send a, a message or, or call your fathers if, if you're still able to and let them know how much you love them. And you're welcome to join us at church. We're going to have a Father's Day grill after service here at, at our building. And you're welcome to come join us if you'd like, if you live in the area. Uh, probably somewhere around noon is when service will be over. And we invite you to come join us. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, if you're able to join us for service, that would be great too. But even if you watch our services online, you are welcome to turn the computer off or the TV off and then get up and come join us for lunch. Amen. So God bless you. We'll see Take you next care, week. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.